Good afternoon, everyone. Andy Jacob here with the Dot Com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Buckle up, my friends. We have an amazing show today. We've been able to book Mr. Peter Sage, and Peter is a world-renowned entrepreneur. He's an incredible author. He's a philosopher. He's a teacher. He helps so many people in their personal lives. He's unbelievable. He helps people worldwide reinvent themselves. You want to stay tuned for today's show because by the time we're done with this show with Peter Sage today, it's a very good possibility that you may change for the better and for the positive just by listening to Peter for 30 minutes. Peter, thank you for coming on the show. Wow, great, uh, great introduction, Andy. Thank you so much. No pressure at all. But it's all good. I'm, uh, I'm here to, I'm here to serve and help. This is super amazing. You're, you're a best-selling author. We're going to talk about your book and get into it all momentarily. But Peter, let's start off by pulling the lens back to thirty thousand feet. Tell people what you do and how you're able to make such an impact in so many people's lives. Well, appreciate the question. And uh, one of the first things I like to say and remind people of here, Andy, is the fact that you know, I'm, I'm just a guy. You know, there's a tendency in modern society to elevate people onto pedestals. And the second you do that, you minimize your own greatness by contrast, or you leave a, a gap or a chasm that excuses like, well, it's okay for them, but yeah, I can't do it because starts to come up. So the first thing I want to say is, hey, I'm just a normal guy. I dropped out of school at 16. I've got no formal qualifications. Uh, I couldn't spell MBA. Uh, I basically started my career. I started my first business at 17. And I also at that time fell into the world of personal development and personal growth. And for me, it was like, whoa, hang on a minute. You mean there's an industry that teaches success? Where was that in school? You know, I know what I wanted to learn in school. I, I didn't want to learn algebra or the periodic table. I wanted to learn something that would help me become successful. And I had this epiphany. I had this, this whole aspect of thinking that if I go get a job, uh, even if it's a well-paid job, I'm always going to be earning less than what I'm worth because by the very nature of working for somebody else, they have to pay me less than the job's worth. Otherwise, there's nothing in it for the business owner. And so my entrepreneurial career and my personal growth career kind of took off at the same time. That's 31 years ago now. I've been officially unemployable for 31 years. And what has really helped my career, and I built 27 international companies. You know, some have failed majestically. You know, some have been you know, global success stories. Some have you know, uh, should have stayed ideas when I was drunk. Yeah, and pretty much everything in between. And, and what really has made that uh, journey so enriching yeah, having seen a lot, done a lot, lost a lot, made a lot, you know, had a lot of fun. It's really the, the passion of understanding human behavior. And I'll tell you how it came about because personal growth, and I'm sure many of the, the viewers understand, it, is a, a huge wide chasm of, of lots of different aspects, whether it's self-improvement, making more money, getting more yeah, peace. And I'm a great believer there's a huge difference between a life chasing success and a life chasing fulfillment. Because I see so many people get to the top of what they thought was success mountain and want to jump off, right? They've, you know, they work their entire career so that they can hopefully get to this you know, end of the rainbow and they sacrifice their relationship. They sacrifice their health. They miss their kids growing up so that hopefully one day they can get to this place where, you know, they have it all. And what do they find out? Well, they have it all. They've made enough money so that now they can pay for their divorce yeah, they can hire a personal trainer to get their health back and hopefully buy their kids loads of stuff so they love them again. Uh, and it's like, isn't that the lie that so many people unfortunately blindly fall into? And I didn't want that. I, in my 20s, I'll be honest. Yeah, I was building companies to you know, buy my Ferraris and fly Concorde because I was so driven by the insecurities as a young man trying to prove to the world I was good enough. And of course, I was very you know, driven by ego. I was an asshole to work for. I was like, you know, it was, it, it was a, a, it was a growing experience. When I finally realized that, yeah, what lights us up is really a life chasing fulfillment. And that has to do with a lot of adding value and putting a smile on other people's face. I really started to unlock the code. And 
Uh, and that's what I'm, I'm happy to share. And that's what I do share with the people and, and hopefully give them other things to think about than the standard mainstream rehashed, recycled, motivational blurb that really doesn't do a lot. Wow, Peter, the way you lay it out makes all the sense in the world. How do you define success? Because you mentioned, you know, people work hard and then they make all the money and then they have the money, you know, to pay to pay the wife or the husband off in the divorce and to buy things for their kids to love them again and and other things that I can't even say it as magically as you said it. But how do you define success in your mind, Peter? Well, as I said, most people think success is the accumulation of wealth, significance, uh, maybe getting a family so they feel they have some belonging or sense of connection or whatever it is. They're chasing something outside of themselves. Yeah, success for me is realizing that, yeah, I'm doing what I'm doing because I love doing it, not because I'm trying to validate myself by achieving something at the end of it. And the, the analogy that I give Andy here, and I'm sure a lot of the, the, the listeners and the viewers will be able to relate to this, I call it the curse of the white rabbit. And if you go to a, a dog track, you know, and the, the, uh, uh, historically, you know, uh, we, we've all gone to the dogs, as it were, you know, where they gamble on the, the greyhounds that run around the track. And what happens, they open the trap, the dogs run, and people bet on who's going to win the race. Now, the question is, why do the dogs run? And the obvious answer is that they're chasing that rabbit. But a better question to ask is, does the dog ever catch the rabbit? Well, of course not. No. Well, hang on, what if it runs faster? No. What if it has a better diet than the other dogs? What if it sleeps in a better kennel, has a better track? See, the dog's never going to catch the rabbit, not because it's not a good enough dog, but because by design, the game is rigged so that they can never catch the rabbit. Now, if you imagine the dog's at the end of the race, turns around to his friend and he says, hey, pff, I've ran three races this week. I've won two of them. Still haven't caught that damn rabbit. I quit. No, if you ever see the dogs at the end of a, a race, they are ecstatic. Why? Because they got to run, and that's what greyhounds are born to do. See, entrepreneurs are born to build businesses. That's what they do. But if they're validating their self-worth with their net worth by feeling they have to catch the rabbit, they're never going to get to a place where they have the fulfillment of knowing that they, all, they already are that which they seek. And when you can come to that, you really have success. Now, you can choose to go play the game, go chase the goal, get the girl, get the body, whatever it may be. But if you're doing it because you're playing the fundamentally flawed game that so many people play, which is feel great when. Feel great when I make my million dollars, when I meet my soulmate, when I lose 20 pounds, when I you know, get my promotion, when, fill in the blank. If you're playing the game of feel great when, I got news for you. You may be happy when you catch that rabbit. Because, you know, we set goals, we can get them. But how many times have we been fulfilled when we've got a goal? Only about a, how, how long is it before that little next white fluffy tail appears and we go off chasing that thinking, well, I thought I was going to be happy now, but it must be the next. See, I, I thought I'd be happy when I made my first million. Do you know what happened? I made my first million. And I thought, well, I'm not as happy as I thought I would be. Oh, I know. It's because I need two million in case I lose the first. And I've worked with people worth $780 million, miserable as hell because they're not a billionaire. That game never ends. The only game in town. If you want real success, there's only one game in town. And that is feel great now. Not feel great now only if. That's another version of feel great when. Feel great now. Why? Because you can always find something to be grateful for. As Napoleon Hill said, every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. The challenge is most people are too busy complaining about the adversity to water the seed of the benefit. And when we can start to wake up a little and think, guys, life is lived through the experience of emotion. So how successful are you because you've got X trillion dollars in the bank? All right, well, ask yourself a better question. What emotions are you experiencing more often? That'll tell you whether life is successful or not not a bank balance. Money is simply a, a way to magnify our decision space. If you're generous, money will give you more options to be generous. If you're yeah, tight, money will give you more yeah, reasons to be tight. Now, it's, it's a magnifier of who we are. That's all money is. And if people think money's going to solve their problems, I've got news for you. 
The only reason you think that is because the problems that you're immediately facing right now are probably caused by lack of money. So you think money's going to solve your problems. They're not. You're just going to trade up for a bigger quality problem. Because life's a growth centric experience. And when we wake up to that fact, it changes. Peter, that is absolutely awesome. You know, you've inspired tens of thousands of people throughout the world to help them reinvent themselves. Obviously, we've been going through a pandemic with COVID. There's a lot of people that have taken a beating, beating psychologically throughout the world because of this pandemic. And I was very, very interested to sort of get your insight, your sagism, if you will, about people that are having a tough time going through this pandemic. What can you tell them to help them come out the other side of this better than ever? There are a lot of people that are being crushed right now. I get that. There are also a lot of people that are crushing it. And the difference isn't that they just happen to be in an industry that isn't affected. There's none of that. You'll see people from all ages, backgrounds, yeah, they're, whether they're on furlough, lost their job, yeah, lost loved ones that are still making it work. What is the difference that makes that difference? Well, I've studied that. And again, human behavior is my game. And I'll be, I'll be honest, it's down to the level of emotional maturity. And some people don't like to hear that, but let me explain because we weren't taught this in school. You see, when it comes to biological maturity, I've got news for you, right? It's non-negotiable. We don't get to vote on whether we age or not. I don't care what vitamins you take. I don't care how many creams you put on, right? You and I are going to age. We're going to look different 20 years from now than we do today. You know, we look different today than we did 20 years ago. It's part of the rule set. But emotional maturity is a choice. And when it comes to that, there's really three primary keys that I've seen separate those who go out and crush it versus those who get crushed. The first step on the, the road of emotional maturity, something which should be taught in schools, is the day we finally become okay not being liked. And a lot of people struggle with that because they're still running around trying to find somewhere to re-plug in their umbilical cord and then yeah, wonder why yeah, life beats them up. But when you can be okay not being liked, it's not that you don't care what other people think, it's that you recognize people can only ever project from the place that they're at. Yeah, it's not about you, it's always about them. They're only projecting their own model of the world. And the challenge is most of us live our life in this sticky, nasty, you know, smelly substance called goop, G-O-O-P, the good opinion of other people. And when you are trapped in goop, you can never be authentic because you're always trying to be this chameleon. Oh, if they don't like me this way, I'll be that way. Oh, I don't say what I really think because maybe they, all of that stuff. And the way to get out of that, I'll share a metaphor with you. <clears throat> I believe we all star in the movie of our life. And I know you star in the movie of your life because you're the only one that's in every single scene of the movie of your life, which means by definition, other people are one of two things. They're either at best a supporting cast maybe a handful of people, spouse, sibling, loved one, whatever. The vast, vast majority of people in your movie are nothing more, Andy, than film extras. Now, what's the definition of a film extra? Somebody you're not thinking about when they're not in your scene, right? <clears throat> so here's the thing. Because we see ourselves as the star of our movie, we walk around in our movie thinking everybody else sees us as the star of our movie. And of course, they're starring in a different movie. They're in their own, which means by definition, at best for maybe five or six people, we are a supporting cast. But the vast majority of people that we will meet in our lifetime are nothing more than extras in our movie. And we are extras in their movie from their perspective because they're starring in their movie, not ours. So to get out of goop is pretty simple. You finally wake up to the realization that most people don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion. Why? because they're too busy being worried about what they think you're thinking of them. And when you own that, it's like, whoa, freedom. You're not pushed, pulled, cajoled, manipulated by what you perceive to be other people's opinion, other people's drama, all of that stuff. And when you can do that, it's really the first step of being able to walk your own truth, not toe the government line or the freaking mainstream narrative or whatever's going on that you think you're blaming for your current circumstances. Now, the second big part of emotional maturity, and this is a big part where people, if they got this now today, it would transform their relationship to their current problems. And that is this, it's the day where we finally come to terms 
with the fact that life is a growth-centric experience, not a comfort-centric experience. Everything in nature grows and contributes or it's taken out of the food chain. You know, the strongest trees grow in the strongest winds, not the best soil. If you want to become the best version of yourself, pray for some strong winds and don't bitch about them when they show up. You see, we're in the classroom. I call it earth school. And so if we want to realize that we have two competing things going on, it's pretty simple, but we never think about it. We are, as a human being, in my opinion, the encapsulation of, of the physical and non-physical. See, we're physical, we have a body, but it's not us. You know, if I cut my arm off, I lose 15% of my body, but I don't lose 50% of me. Yeah, what makes you, you, Andy, what makes the, the listeners and the viewers them is not the physical. As I said, that's going to change. But it's the invisible stuff. It's the non-physical stuff. It's your hopes, your dreams, your personality, your sense of humor, your vision, your, the, all of that stuff. If I was to take that out of you and put it into somebody else, they would be, you know, you would be them with a different body, right? Yeah, that, yeah, you'd still be Andy, you just have a different body. So the essence of who we are is non-physical. So as a human being, we're physical, non-physical. So how does this tie in? Well, in the physical sense, we have a nervous system that is hardwired for comfort. Now, that's useful when it comes to sitting too close to a fire. That's useful when it comes to sitting on an ant's nest. It's designed to program us for comfort. But the non-physical, the major part of who we are that makes us us, our soul is wired for growth. And growth does not happen in a comfort zone. See, if you realize that, you, you know, <clears throat> imagine you, you were an athlete, but you didn't know you were an athlete. And you were put in the gym and you got this personal trainer show up and they're trying to make you run on the treadmill until you throw up, do press ups until you can't move your arms. You're like, I hate this guy. And you're hiding behind the weight stack. Whenever you see them, you're trying to just tick the box to do the workout enough to do the workout so you can leave. Well, you go to an athlete who's looking to get the gold medal and say, oh, what's your thoughts on skimping on your workouts? They're going to look at you like, are you kidding me? I'm an athlete, this is what I'm born for. If I'm not throwing up in 30 minutes, I'm gonna sack my personal trainer, All right? Completely different perspective. So take ourselves and our current challenges and our current problems. If you are taking the perspective of the muscle fiber, what's happening on that last burning rep? Stop it, send pain messages to the brain. You're breaking me down here, I'm, I can't, I'm being overloaded, I'm being destroyed, help, stop. But if you take the mindset of the athlete, you're proud that you just busted out that last rep and can't lift your arms. And I have to invite people that in a growth-centric experience that life is, life will give you the feedback that if you're trying to engineer a life that's just comfort-driven, you're going to get slapped. Life's going to slap you about. It's trying to get your attention. Okay? If you recognize that what's happening now is going to be the greatest opportunity for you to become the best version of yourself, you're going to see opportunities where other people don't. You're going to rise to the challenge rather than like bow down to it. You're going to have a, you're going to ask better questions and questions are the steering wheel of the mind. Questions direct focus. Yeah. Ask him to, oh, why me? Your brain's trained to answer it. Why? Because you suck. Oh, why, why is this happening to me? Oh, because yeah, your dad said you were born unlucky. It's like, whatever it may be. Oh, because my elder brother always got the attention. It'll find an answer. In fact, if people haven't figured it out yet, let me explain the role of the mind. Yeah, it has many jobs, but it, one of its predominant roles is to justify your current emotional experience to be in line with your behavior. So if you're feeling sad, yeah, it's going to encourage you to think thoughts that will reinforce being sad. Yeah, if the alarm goes off in the morning and you're tired, it'll come up with the perfect excuse to press the snooze button. Not based on truth not based on your highest potential, based upon the fact that its job is to justify your behavior to be in alignment with your emotional state. Yeah, if you're angry, it's going to come up with a reason why you shouldn't apologize. Right? That's, that's how the mind works. And if you're listening to your mind from a comfort-centric experience, it is going to sell you down the river and blame the government. It's going to blame the economy. It's going to blame yeah, your boss. It's going to... And you can't get on in life if you're trying to be a victim, because nowhere in nature is the word victim rewarded. Now they say misery loves company, right? I disagree. I think misery loves miserable company. 
I love it. Are, I love it. Wow, gotta, Peter, this is unbelievable. I love your concept about feel great when people always do that. You know, I'm going to feel great when this happens. I'm going to feel great when that happens. And you've really nailed it down. And I'm sure you're helping a lot of people just by being on this show. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question, Peter. You know, you speak to a lot of businesses. People reach out to you to help their businesses. You're a turnaround expert in business because you have such an understanding of the psychological and, and uh, psychographic profile of the entrepreneur. What do you see differentiates th those entrepreneurs that are able to push through and become great versus those entrepreneurs that sort of get caught in the mud and, and muddle along and never really get to where they want to go? Understood. Great question. There's a, there's a couple of different angles to it. One of them is the impetus for why you started the business. If you, are start, if you started your business to try to prove to the world you're good enough, if you started your business because it was a, a vehicle for you to get stuff, I want more money, I want a better home, I want to prove to my elder brother that I'm better than him, blah, blah whatever it may be. If it's an egocentric need for starting the business, you're going to panic when stuff looks like that is going to be threatened. Why? Because your self-worth and net worth are being tied together. And if your net worth seems to be threatened because there's a pivot in the economy or the customer base or whatever it may be, you know, the competition steps up. If there's a challenge to your net worth, that will trigger a fear of your self-worth and that primary fear every human being really has, which is the fear we're not enough. Not good enough, not yeah, good looking enough, tall enough, short enough, whatever it is, fill in the blank. Yeah. So if you started your business either for personal egocentric reasons, yeah, or you are more of a technician than an entrepreneur is the other reason. Meaning that you, know, you worked as a mechanic for this garage for years, but yeah, you always wanted to start your own business. What business are you going to start? Most likely you're going to start a garage. Well, you're not actually a entrepreneur. You're a technician who suffered from an entrepreneurial fit one day and decided to start their business. Now, nothing wrong with that. You're, you're a, 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 a top of your craft as a technician. But entrepreneurs have a different characteristic, and this is what I see as the main difference, and that is the ability to handle uncertainty. Now, if you have a higher ability to handle uncertainty when things in business pivot and the economy crashes or, you know, all of a sudden you're in the travel business and now people can't fly or whatever it may be. If you've started it for egocentric reasons, you're already coming from fear. If you started it from a place of being a certainty driven because you're more of a technician, then you, you're not looking for solutions. You're looking for you know, how to fix holes. If you're an entrepreneur, this is just another day at the office. It's like, okay, so this is the path I've been walking down. We have to change direction. Right, executive team, let's brainstorm. How do we take advantage of this? How do we move? How do we serve our customers better in the current climate? How do we solve pain points? How do we become preeminent? How do we move quickly and decisively? Because yeah, there's no room in this level of yeah, economy for hesitation. Oh, let's just see what happens and hope it goes back to normal. Yeah, people that thought that 12 months ago and didn't move are dead. Yeah, in the water. So yeah, how do you turn it around? Ask yourself, where am I coming from? In all the high level business entrepreneurs I've coached yeah, from yeah, centimillionaires, billionaires, the, and people that have come to me with issues to, they really want solved. I have never seen a problem in the business that wasn't systemic as a problem in the business owner. You solve the problem with the business owner, the business will solve itself because it's their business. They know it better than you did. Of course, I, I mean, I can teach you how to outmarket your competition and yeah, do better sales and marketing in my sleep. I mean, that's, that's just part of the experience space, but it's, it's not really the issue. If the business owner is still running issues that have nothing to do with the, what the issue they think it is, now I'll give you a quick example. Business owner comes to me, stressed out of his brain. Why? Too busy, needs time management. So he approaches me for time management. Well, guess what? 99% of business coaches and consultants out there are going to put him on a time management you know, course and, and teach him some really cool time management stuff. And yeah, I can do that. But that's addressing symptoms, not you know, the, the course. I'm a human behavior expert. So a few questions later, and I realized that time management isn't the issue. The issue is he is afraid of saying no. It's an inability to deal with rejection. 
And if he says no to people, it'll trigger a rejection response in his mind. So he's saying yes to too many things. So therefore his calendar's full. Therefore he thinks he needs time management. So let's deal with the ability to handle rejection so you can draw boundaries, say no, and then not take on too much. Because if you teach somebody like that time management, all they're going to do is create more space in their calendar to put more things in and be more, just as stressed, if not more. Yeah, I could go on and on, but you, you get the idea. That is absolutely amazing. And I see exactly where you're going with this. I know you've helped so many entrepreneurs, so many business people, so many people in their lives. And it's just really, really inspirational. And when we think about inspiration, you have a book and it's called The Inside Track. And I'm so excited to talk about this with you, Peter. Uh, Peter, it's an inspirational guide to conquering adversity. And, and, and it's so poignant right now. This book is, has been written with all your passion and all your background and experience. And you put it all into this book uh, that, that is getting rave reviews already. Let's talk about that a little bit, Peter. Let's tell us about the book and tell us what, what prompted you to write such an amazing, op, uh, amazing book to help people conquer adversity. It, it was never meant to be a book. And this is a very unique story, but it also underscores one of the key principles of personal growth. And that is this. Theory doesn't cover the price of admission to the higher levels of greatness. You see, I can stand here this side of the camera and talk a good game. And somebody could turn and say, yeah, it's okay for you in your nice place in Tenerife and uh, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I've just lost my job. I've got three kids to feed. I've, you know, all of that stuff. I get it, guys. I really do. I don't come from theory. That's not my game. Yeah, I couldn't teach you how to make a million dollars if I hadn't done it enough times. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have any right to do so. But I was... Uh, <laughs> The, the, the book came about in very unique circumstances. I'll give you a brief background because hopefully this story will also inspire a lot of people. I was uh, doing some business back with a, a major multi-billion, multi-national you know, firm uh, in the IT department. And, uh, and I, I think I bought uh, $12 million worth of goods. I you know, resold it, small margin profit. And several years later, they knocked on my door with a team of ruthless lawyers from a $100 million law firm, you know, Princess Diana's divorce lawyers, Mish Rea, suing me for $17 million. And I'm like, what? They're like, well, we didn't give you permission to resell the goods. I'm like, you never told me I couldn't. I don't have a contract. So I take full title. It's mine. Do what I want. Anyway, they, they got upset because one of their suppliers had bought some stuff from me. Yeah, and they, they basically says, listen, give us a hundred grand. We'll make it all go away. I'm like, oh, I get it. You just want a bit of the profit that I made. You're a bit jealous. You want to try to teach me this. I'm not playing the game. Six months later, they issue a contempt of court application saying the judge that I breached the court order. I'm like, I haven't done that. And I looked at their argument and it was clever. It was, it was intelligent. It was well-structured, but complete distortion of context. At the time, this is, by the way, this is just four years ago. And at the time, I was running uh, uh, one of my consulting businesses. I was you know, helping thousands of people a month. I got 53 staff with six figures in, in revenue every month. And I, I turned around to my staff and I said, guys, I've just got to go into court next week and get rid of this BS. I show up in court. They have an entire team. And most business owners will understand that when it comes to litigation, yeah, it's simply a tool. In business, litigation is a tool. It's not about who's right or wrong. It's who can hire the best storytellers, pretty much. Yeah, I thought it was a chess move. And I went to counter the chess move. Anyway, they were better players. They sold it to the judge. He gave me six months in prison as a civil prisoner. Never been accused of a crime. Still don't have a criminal record. Six months in jail, the most violent jail in the UK, Pentonville. And I lost everything. My business went from 53 staff to three staff in like three minutes. Um, I, we, we, I was hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal debt. They awarded the legal costs against me. They, uh, I, I, I lost my you know, relationship, my, my wedding. My, I mean, it's, it was, everything was pulled out from under me. Now I understood something. You, you can't change what has already happened. Complaining at what has already happened is futile. Most people resist what is or what has happened when they could be channeling that energy into what's the next best move. So I decided that, you know, I spent 15 years as an experienced trainer working with Tony Robbins around the world. Yeah, human behavior is something that, yeah, I'm, I know about and helping people is something that I do for a living. So I thought, wow, I've been very blessed that over the last 20 plus years, 
I've helped millions of people. Maybe the people I could help the most never get to see my kind of work because they're in somewhere like jail. If the universe wants to send me in to go help people, let me go. I said that to my fiance as I was in court. If there's... Anyway, I, uh, I didn't go in with the identity of a prisoner. I made a decision to go in with the identity of a secret agent of change. And to cut a long story short, I ended up getting a lot of the prisoners off drugs. I was stopping suicides. I redesigned the intake system to reduce violence that's now being used in prisons all over the world. I won a national award while I was in there for the work that I was doing. And it turned out to be one of the most awe-inspiring adventures I've ever had the privilege of living. Now, when, it, when I went in, I, every two weeks, I wrote private letters to my senior students showing them how I was doing what I was doing. Yeah, how was I being able to stop violence? How would I be able to walk in when I'm not the biggest guy in the room, nor do I want to be, and diffuse fights with weapons that were about to kick off? How do I get somebody who is about to commit suicide and stop them, not just in the moment, you can do anybody, changes anybody's state, but stop permanently? Yeah, how was I able to walk in smiling, having lost everything I'd worked for, and turn it around? And these letters, I wrote 11 of them over the six months. And when I came out, my students said they'd learned more from the 11 letters than following me around the world for the last two years on stage. And I had to publish because it would help a lot of people. And I'm like, guys, this is never meant to be a book. This is private letters. It's part journal, part tradecraft, how-to manual at the highest level. And yeah, part, you couldn't make it up, but it's real. Anyway, we, we went ahead and we published the letters, just the unedited letters. And it went bestseller in two hours, Amazon number one in four hours. It sold to 40 countries on the first day, outsold three suppliers on the first day. And if you check any review on Amazon or Goodreads or Audible, it's actually changed the life of, I would say, 95% or more of the people who have read the book. It's completely turned their life around. Uh, and guys, I know, yeah, if you think, wow, but I teach you how to do it. That's what the book was for my students. And some of these guys were paying me at the time I went away, 50 grand a year to learn this stuff. And I'm basically giving it away now to try to help people and this was four years ago. So when I went in, it was a couple of years ago we published. You couldn't have timed it better for the current climate. You know, a lot of people suffering and facing adversity right now. What tool set do you need? What practical steps do you need to take? What kind of self-talk do you need? What beliefs do you have to question? You know, what kind of you know, steps can you take so that you're the one person in your family that when everybody's panicking, you can walk in a room and say, don't worry, I'll handle it. How do you become the example for your kids right now that are freaking out? How do you become the example for your community? That's what this book teaches. And, and I'm just so proud and blessed I had the opportunity to lose everything to write those letters to help the people I'm helping today. Peter, this is absolutely unbelievable. I, I think you have a, a copy of the book. Hold it up and show the cover to, to the audience. Uh, this is absolutely amazing. Based on the letters you wrote uh, from a challenging situation to your students to becoming a, a, a worldwide national and national bestseller, absolutely unbelievable. And this is just an honor to have you on the show, Peter. This has been great. I know you only sliced out a certain amount of time. I know you're helping so many people and so many companies right now. And, and it's just been an inspirational journey with you over the past 45 minutes just to talk to you and learn more about your process. You come across so amazingly. I know you're a compassionate person. I know that you are very modest uh, in terms of in terms of looking at higher powers to, to also help in your journey and you're a very kind person. Maybe we could talk about that just a little bit. I'm going to ask one final question. It's sort of an interesting and funny question and pardon me for indulging myself a little bit, but I think you're the only person that I've ever asked this to in, in a multitude of interviews we've done, Peter. What's it all about? What's it all about? You mean life? Yes. As far as I can see. Yeah, and I, I have my answer. I don't have the answer. I only have my answer. We all have our own answers. But when I, when I look at what makes life work and what makes life sticky and, and with friction, yeah, I really see that the, the purpose of life, what it's leading us towards, is to choose love over fear in ever more challenging circumstances. When you come from a place of serving contribution, ethnocentricity, and trying to help put a smile on somebody else's face more than yours, life tends to work better. If you're doing it from being, not from intellect, if you're, if you're trying to give from empty to get, that's not the way, right? If you're giving from your overflow, 
then it works. And, and that's not just hyperbole and, and esoteric. I mean, let's go apart from every spiritual master on the planet kind of taught this. Well, Jesus taught the road to salvation via unconditional love. Uh, the Buddha taught you know, um, self-realization to enlightenment. But if you look at, let's, let's go to evolution. 400 million years of fossil records tell us something. They tell us that life is trying to evolve into ever more higher levels of complexity. So if you go back 400 million years, you look at an amoeba, a single celled organism. You look at the human body, 50 plus trillion cells. Now, if you take 50 trillion individual amoebas and one food source, what do you got? Well, I'll tell you, war, right? It's like, yep, survival of the fittest. But if you have a human body in one food source, here's what I know. The liver and the spleen don't try to gang up against the kidney and the lungs for who's going to get more hemoglobin. So the key to evolution, the key is to what life is trying to tell us why we are here uh, as we evolve in ever more high levels of complexity. It only works under one category, cooperation, not competition. Cooperation allows the human body to do what it does to, for us to, to be where we're at. Now, if you take the word cooperation and you extrapolate that to its natural conclusion, in my world, you hit one word, love. Why are we here? We're here to learn how to love, my friend. That's it. Peter, that is absolutely awesome. Thank you on behalf of the people at Dotcom Magazine for slicing this time out. And I'm going to thank you on behalf of all the people that are going to watch this show and improve themselves just by listening to you. It's really a unique way that you have to look at the world and how to relate to life. And it's very empowering, very powerful, and very special. Peter, Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, Andy, it's, it's my pleasure. It's, it's such a pleasure. I've actually got a gift for all of your readers and your viewers, if you don't mind. I, I know how much people are hurting right now uh, in, the, in the situation. I know what this book will do for them. So I want to give a copy away to every single one of your viewers and your readers. And yeah, if you like, a, a physical copy, I mean, if, if you just help me cover a little bit towards the shipping, I will send you on my behalf. And you can go to Barnes & Noble and pay $24.95 if you want, but yeah, cover me towards the shipping and I will send you a copy on me. Uh, I've had a ton printed and uh, you can, I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. But if you go to petersage.com forward slash, yeah, Andy Jacob, then they'll be able to go claim their free copy of that book. And uh, uh, with my pleasure, and all I'm asking for is please, if you read that, yeah, because reading it is part of the game, right? A lot, a lot of the time we bought books and they've, they've ended up as doorstops. Yeah, this is not, this is not a notebook to, to prop up your shelf with. This is an inspirational guide to conquering adversity. And I promise you, read the first chapter. That's all I ask. You'll be hooked. Yeah, this is a page turner. And if you do that, simply as a thank you to me, leave me a review that's authentic and honest so other people can benefit if they're thinking of buying the book. That's all I'll ask in return for sending a copy to everybody. Peter, that is so generous. Thank you so much again. This has been an absolute honor and an absolute delight. Mine too. Great to be here. Thank you, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing. You're inspiring so many people. It's just been a pleasure to be part of the process. Mm -hmm.